My dear students, welcome. Now we are here to discuss the cholinergic system, roughly equaling the parasympathetic nervous system, which is also called PANS, is parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, which takes care of your baseline functions like digestion, waste elimination, the secretions, the control of light going on to the retina and controlling the heart. The parasympathetic outflow comes from the cranial sacral region, that's midbrain, medulla, and sacral 2, 3, 4. The cranial nerves 3, 5, 7, 9, and 10. The carotid sinus, the body, the aortic arch, and the body, the pelvic nerve. The ganglia and the parasympathetic nervous system are located near or in the innervated tissue, and naturally, you have short postganglionic fibers. This system works on discrete organs and it does not work as a single unit and the neurotransmitter, representative neurotransmitter for the system is acetylcholine. Because it ends with choline, acetylcholine, you said a cholinergic nervous system or the cholinergic receptors. Let's have a look at the cholinergic transmission and the synthesis of the acetylcholine. As for the synthesis of acetylcholine is concerned, you get entry of choline with the help of carrier A inside the nerve terminal which happens under the control of sodium. The choline combines with acetyl-CoA and you get the action of the enzyme choline acetyltransferase. This choline acetyltransferase leads to formation of acetyl-choline. This acetyl-choline with the help of carrier B enters the granule and in influence of calcium, acetylcholine is released. Whatever acetylcholine is released outside acts on the cholinergic receptors and later it gets broken down with the help of the enzyme acetylcholine esterase into choline and acetate. Next, we go to discuss the storage and metabolism of acetylcholine. The termination of action happens by the help of two enzymes. One is acetylcholine esterase that's true choline esterase present mainly in the synapse and the RBCs and butyl choline esterase which is pseudocholine esterase present mainly in the blood plasma in the liver and in the other tissues. Let's come to the cholinergic receptor sites. Cholinergic receptor sites are divided into muscarinic sites and the nicotinic sites. A very important sites, muscarinic receptor sites. I'll first have a look at this slide and concentrate. The first important side is heart. The next one is the smooth muscle in the genitourinary system, in the respiratory system and in the gastrointestinal tract. Then next you have exocrine glands. Next you have sphincter pupillary muscle which is responsible for meiosis. And you also have ciliary muscle of lens which is concerned with accommodation. The cholinergic nervous system due to this action of the cholinergic receptor site in the eye is going to lead to decrease in the intraocular pressure. There is also cholinergic receptor site in the central nervous system and you also have the cholinergic site in the parietal cells. Let's have a look at the actions, the cholinergic actions. Acetylcholine is the prototype. Naturally, when acetylcholine acts on the heart, it is going to lead to decreased contractility. So I am trying to show it by a downward arrow and it is a M2 receptor site, is the subtype of muscarinic receptor. The smooth muscle obviously needs acetylcholine for contraction. So cholinergic receptor site or the cholinergic action would be increased in the smooth muscle contraction and that's the M3 site. Exocrine glands which are going to secrete. For the secretion to happen, there is a need of acetylcholine and naturally the secretions increase as a muscarinic receptor site and it's again M3 receptor site. The sphincter pupillae, which produces meiosis, is under parasympathetic control and is M3 site. The ciliary muscle of lens, which also contracts for accommodation, is under the control of the muscarinic receptor site M3. The intraocular pressure is decreased, as I already described, and the parietal cells in the gastric mucosa, they contain M1 receptor. If you have a broad view at these particular receptor sites, we could summarize that the smooth muscle, the exocrine gland, the sphincter pupillae, and the ciliary muscle of lens, that's whole of the eye. So smooth muscle, exocrine glands, and eye is going to have M3 receptor. 
The heart contains M2 receptor and the central nervous system would contain M4 and M5 receptor. M1 receptor is present in the parietal cells of gastric mucosa which will be responsible for secretion of gastric hydrochloric acid. So that's the summary of the muscarinic receptor sites. Coming to the nicotinic receptor sites, you have an important site, skeletal neuromuscular junction, the skeletal muscle, the skeletal neuromuscular junction, because it's a muscle, it's derived as N, a capital N for nicotinic site, and M to indicate the muscle. So it's called NM, is the skeletal muscle or the skeletal neuromuscular junction. Autonomic ganglia and adrenal medulla, these two sites are also nicotinic sites, but they are designated as capital N and another N, that's NN. So in the nicotinic receptor sites, you have skeletal muscle, neuromuscular junction, you have autonomic ganglia, and you have adrenal medulla. Muscarinic receptors are mostly G-protein coupled receptors. The M2 receptor in the heart has GP protein, which leads to decrease in the adrenal cyclase, decrease in the cyclic AMP, increase in the potassium conductance, all this leads to decrease in the rate and force of contraction. The M1 and M3 receptors are also G protein coupled, but this is not GP, this is GQ protein. It leads to stimulation of the phospholipase A2, leading in turn to increase in the inositol phosphate 3 and diacylglycerol, leading to increase in the cytosolic calcium. The nicotinic receptor is a cation channel receptor. In the skeletal neuromuscular junction, you mainly have a sodium cation channel and a potassium cation channel. And in the autonomic ganglion adrenal medulla, you also have sodium, potassium as well as calcium. To classify the cholinergic drugs, we can classify them into directly acting and indirectly acting. What do we mean by directly acting? Directly acting drugs are going to go and combine with the muscarinic or nicotinic receptor site and they are going to stimulate this particular receptor site so they will be the agonist of the cholinergic receptors. We divide them into the esters of choline that's acetylcholine, aricholine and the three drugs bethanocol, carbacol and methacholine which are not much commonly used these days. The second group in the directly acting agents is the alkaloids, the cholinomimetic alkaloids includes pilocarpine which is obtained from a South American plant. And the miscellaneous agents in this directly acting include sevimelin and oxotremorin. These drugs are the directly acting cholinergic drugs and it's better to discuss the directly acting cholinergic drugs before going to the classification of indirectly acting cholinergic drugs. The directly acting cholinergic drugs like bethanocol, carbacol and methacholine, have a look at the slide, are useful in post-operative paralytic ileus, in retention of urine and in intestinal gastric and bladder atrony. Bethanocol in addition is useful to test the bronchial hyperreactivity by the route of inhalation. Carbacol is used rarely but it could be useful in glaucoma and it could be useful to produce meiosis in ocular surgery. And methacholine is mostly used for all the conditions that we mentioned in the beginning that's post-operative paralytic alias, retention of urine and intestinal gastric and bladder attorney.